right, well, the players are seated and just about ready in our feature match here. So let's head on down and let them get started. We're going to be watching TJ Radizak on your left playing Yogmoth, and he's going to be fighting off against Mason Clark, one of our special guests, on Rakdos Evoke. And uh, Mason has a ton of experience with this archetype, and it looks like he's got a turn one thought seize. Yeah, Mason came to his first Apex event last month, ended up top eighting both days. So he is riding high with this Rakdos Evoke deck, looking to you know make it a three for three or even four for four tomorrow in Pioneer. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, he's playing what is considered the best deck in the format right now. So, you know, got to be some smart money on him to make another deep run. So when uh, when you say best deck, uh, I think that that term uh, has changed over the past decade. And to me, the best deck always implied it was unbeatable or it was, you know, the best of the best because it played the best cards. But what does it mean really? I mean... It Rakdos Scam, or Rakdos Evoke, I should say, is the deck that is, you know, the most popular and is still putting up really strong numbers. You often see the most played deck act, you know, actually put up somewhat weaker numbers because weaker players are playing it. You end up playing a lot of mirror matches, and that uh, draws the win rate of the deck back towards 50%. Uh, but Rakdos Evoke, despite being played in very high numbers, is putting up, you know, even stronger numbers than you would expect results uh based on just average performance with that sort of metagame share. All right, well, we're hot and heavy here. Thoughtseize takes Thran, Physician, the Yogmoth, and then we got Ignoble Hire getting blasted by Orcish Bowmasters. This is commonplace, and one of the reasons why you don't see Ignoble Hierarch in the Yogmoth list uh, too often anymore, often replaced with Delighted Halfling. Yeah, you know, that's a big point of contention right now with this Yogmoth deck is what exactly is your mana creature suite? And we do see four copies of Delighted Halfling in TJ's deck. He only has the two copies of Ignoble Hierarch, so trying his best to limit his vulnerability to Orcish Bowmasters, but here, half had to draw it against the Rakdos deck. Mason has the Bowmaster, and so couldn't avoid it this game. All right, well, we have Wall of Roots into Young Wolf for TJ, and back Mason's way, we're going to go Dothy Voidwalker, Fetch Swamp, and then we're going to play another Thought Season. This is going to take a card out of TJ's hand. Looks like we have Grist. Uh, that's a Soul Cauldron. That's a Agatha Soul Cauldron, and then we also have Endurance. And whichever one he takes, Mason might be able to play that off the Do Dothy Voidwalker next turn. So... Yeah, the, what we don't see is a third land, but there is the Wall of Roots for TJ, so he will be able to play any of the cards remaining next turn, depending upon what he wants to do. All right, this Mythic Rare from Wilds of Eldrain, Agnes the Soul Cauldron, two cost legendary artifact. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate abilities of creatures you control. Creatures you control with plus one, plus one counters on them. Uh, have activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with the Soul Cauldron, and then you may tap an exile card from any graveyard, and when a creature is exiled this way, put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. A very combo-centric artifact. Yes, and it allows you to, you know, turn one of your other creatures into a Yawgmoth. So that, that first Yawgmoth from right. TJ getting taken with a Thought Seize by Mason, if he could have played that Soul Cauldron, uh, then you know you can exile with put a counter on one of your other creatures, maybe a token from the Grist, or a, a, you know a mana creature, a Wall of Roots, and suddenly you've got the Ogmoth in play without even having to resolve it. All right. Well, we have Grist coming down, and that's going to sack Wall of Roots, and that's going to blow up the Dothy Voidwalker. So, no fear of an opposing Athica Soul Cauldron for now. And then a Pendlehaven, the draw from uh, TJ. So, going to get to play some nice defense with that young wolf. I don't see Pendlehaven too often in these decks. That's kind of nice. Yeah. yeah. And if Mason wants to attack down this Grist, which is definitely something you know he should be interested in, he's going to have to send the Orcish Bowmasters to its death into the Pendlehaven plus Young Wolf. Yeah. All right. Well, Mason's thumbing hand looks like Vernon Catacombs, one of the uh, cards that can return a creature when it dies in a Fury. If he's able to draw a red card or just a fifth mana source, he can get Fury down next turn. And he's going to go after the Gris. We're going to take it out. And Young Wolf here going to likely block on the Bowmasters. And we're going to pump. And no reason to bring it back because it can't even finish off the Young Wolf. But Gris down. And we're going to go back TJ's way. TJ does take care of that Bowmasters. That is nice. but It is costly. Yeah, very low on resources. I think he just drew a second copy of Yogmoth though. That is a great draw if you can find a fourth land anytime soon. 
Decides to attack for one. Has endurance in hand that he can deploy here at instant speed to block the orc army or just shuffle in a graveyard. We'll see if he wants to do it. And Mason going to be looking for land number five so he can land Fury, but not even a lot of good targets right now. That young wolf will just come back into play. Yeah, Mason had a very strong start here, very disruptive start with those that pair of Thought Seizes, the Bowmaster to take down the Ignoble Hierarch, but hasn't really been able to generate a lot of pressure on TJ's life total. And this Yawgmoth deck is super resilient. If you give it enough time, it will recover and start getting its engine online and draw a ton of cards. Uh, and especially with TJ's life total at 20, any Yawgmoth can be super threatening. All right, so the Endurance is going to put the Graveyard back into the deck for Mason. Uh, didn't have any real interesting or relevant targets, but we're going to put those on the bottom. That's a quarter calling off the top for TJ. He can cord for two here. Uh, instead, wants to get aggressive with this endurance because Mason has dealt himself a lot of damage between oh, fetching yeah. and thought seizing. He thought is, seizes. Uh, yeah, already down to 10. The endurance will drop him to seven. Yeah, and you only really need to uh, quarter calling for one to get a mana creature so that you can play the Yogboth next turn. So. All right, we're going to get Revolt on the Fatal Push, and that's going to take care of Endurance, and now we're going to go back Mason's way. Still doesn't have the land for the Fury. Going to go back to TJ Ratazak after a pass. Yeah, I suspect we will see a cord for a Delighted Halfling here, and that will set up the Yawgmoth for TJ. Yeah, and the Yawgmoth is not uh, damning here necessarily for Mason, and he, he'll probably have one turn to draw the fifth land or the red source, but if he lets TJ untap with it, you have to imagine the game's basically over. Uh, and even if there is the Fury, you know, you can draw two, three cards with it. Now two, with this Bowmaster taking down half of the Young Wolf. Yeah. Okay, going to go back TJ's way after the Bowmaster flashes in. See if TJ wants to go ahead and deploy the Yawgmoth, or maybe wait a turn. Tapping out. Here he is, Yawgmoth, Thran Physician. Protection from humans can proliferate, right. but the most important ability, sack a creature, shrink a creature, and draw a card. Yeah. So we still get three cards here because we can halfling, target our own young wolf, take that plus and plus one counter off, and then get two sacrifices off the young wolf itself. Yeah, Undying, a really powerful ability alongside Yawgmoth uh, Thran Physician, specifically because of how it works, uh, you know, in tandem with uh, the, the minus one, minus one counters, right? Yeah, looks like Mason reading Yawgmoth to see exactly how it'll interact with the Bowmaster. Uh, it sh the Bowmaster should see the card drawn from TJ before I agree, state-based action, state-based checks. So, Bowmaster, the Orc Army should grow, and then we should deal a damage, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And interesting that TJ decided uh, not to uh, target his own Young Wolf. You know, that would have allowed Mason to get an additional trigger off of the Bowmaster, but you get an additional card. Yeah, maybe afraid of Lightning Bolt or something to shoot down the uh, Yawgmoth. Or, I don't know. Afraid of something, clearly. Here's a Fury. We're going to pitch a Kroxa, and I believe he's got the card that can bring it back. Yeah, Kroxa's a one-of in Mason's list. I imagine to help him out in... Oh, uh, this is the one with the roll matches. token. This is the new one. Yeah, playing four copies of that Why one. Why did they get an upgrade? They didn't need <laughs> a, a better version of the effect. What's this card? I believe it's You're Not Dead Yet. Or You Are... No, it's not You're Already Dead. We're going to look it up real quick. I know chat knows. Everyone knows except <laughs> me. But uh, regardless, that is going to put a Wicked Roll on the Fury, so it gets plus and plus one, and when the Wicked Roll goes to the graveyard, TJ will lose a life. Not dead after all. Not dead after all. All right, one black, yes. Uh, until in a turn, creature you control gains. When this creature dies, return to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control, then create a Wicked Roll token attached to it. And the Wicked Roll says if the roll is put into the graveyard, each opponent loses one life. So that one extra damage actually matters a ton and is... A significant upgrade for the deck, even though it's minor. Yeah, and the plus and plus one on the Fury means it's, you know, two extra damage in combat. And now Mason has the attack force here to start pressuring TJ's life total, finding the, you know, combo with the Evoke creature there, any of those recursive instants in black. Uh, you know, really, really key draw there. And TJ was able to draw a couple extra cards off of his Yawgmoth before it died to the first Fury trigger, but none of them super impactful. Just a Blood Artist and a Stringer Geist here now on the battlefield, and that is not going to hold up to this Orc Army or the uh, Wicked Fury. All right, we drew a Wall of Roots. <laughs> we got a Chump Blocker, but we're going to draw a card off of this Peatland through Forest. 
Nothing too scary, but Mason is at seven, and every chump block is an extra trigger from the Blood Artist. So we'll see if Mason can find a way to punch through all these chump blockers. Yeah, that is one thing that the Yawgmoth deck is quite good at. It can buy time with a lot of its undying creatures, chump blocking, and other you know mana creatures and things that it has around. They do have fewer undying creatures than they used to have with all of the you know additions that the deck has made over the last couple sets. It looks like Mason picked up a Feign Death, so if he's able to uh, find another way for one of his creatures to die, but for right now it doesn't seem like it's going to be very useful. TJ doesn't have spot removal in his deck and is looking to kind of chump block and drain him out with Blood Artist. TJ draws for turn. Bunch of lands in play, three creatures that don't look that great against the Fury, but Blood Artist is terrifying. Yeah, that could definitely you know make this a lot trickier for Mason because his life total is already so low. He's dealt himself so much damage this game, and the Wall of Roots does check the army. So you know, o four against the two two. All right, attack for three. Mason is gonna trade with the Orc army. It's a two two, but that Stranger Geist is a three two, and we're gonna drain for one. TJ for, up to seven for a two. Blood Blood Artist triggers off of. All right, both any creature both die. creatures. Now, some people still play, or have started to play Zool Port Cutthroat instead, because Zool Port Cutthroat technically gets around the One Ring, whereas Blood Artist doesn't, but normally you just combo kill your opponent. Oh, we drew Court of Calling! What a huge draw from TJ. So we're going to be able to block and cord for four. Wall of Roots is doing double duty here. I would have been tempted to cord for three on my previous turn, just get a Grist and clean up that Fury, but... TJ going for the Yawgmoth because with this Blood Artist, he's honestly like not that far away from just killing Mason. Right. So, yeah, I like the Yawgmoth play. All right, we're going to draw a card. Drain you for one. Down to three. TJ is going to stay at eight because it costs a life to sacrifice, and he is choosing to do that to shrink and draw a card. Here's Fable the Mirror Breaker from Mason. Going to go back. TJ Radazak's way. Are these ultra rares from the Rectus Evoke deck enough? And no. Stragaroo Geist comes in. And that should seal the deal in favor of TJ Radizak. Game number one going to be in his hands. Yeah, that is the second copy of Stranger Geist. There's only two in the deck, and it is excellent here. And it gets to throw the Wall of Roots at that Goblin Shaman token. Now you can throw the Stranger Geist. It'll come back from Undying. Got a couple Blood Artist triggers. Now I've got two lethal creatures. And yeah, that's all she wrote. Blood Artist looking pretty awesome there, but the story of that game, Mason fetching, shocking early, doing himself a ton of damage with Thought Seizes, and ultimately uh, cobbled together a few last points of damage, and TJ takes down game number one. Yeah, the Ogmoth deck, really not known for uh, winning games without getting its engine online. There, it was just TJ nickel and diming, uh, taking advantage of Mason dealing himself plenty of damage, and really impressive stuff, you know, shows uh, this is a deck that tj's been playing for a couple months now has some good finishes this is what he played last week in columbus and definitely making the most out of a game where he looked pretty far behind during most of it all right well as these players are sideboarding and shuffling up here for game number two we had tj take down game number one ross why don't you give us a little bit of your expert insight into how these players are going to prepare for their post sideboard games so, looking at TJ's sideboard, I see two copies of Force of Vigor, two Elven Chorus, two Endurance, two Fatal Push, one Haywire Might, one Collector Oof, one Soulless Jailer, one Chalice of the Void, one Go for the Throat, one Veil of Summer, and one Fulminator Mage. Not a ton that I like here, but the cards I like are quite good. Uh, I like the Go for the Throat just to get a little removal, deal with some of the bigger creatures, yeah. and keep the pressure off. I like the Veil of Summer. Uh, it is definitely better on the play when you can hold it up for a turn one grief, mm -hmm. uh, but still should be solid against things like Terminate and Fatal Push as well as the discard. The card I really like, though, Elven Chorus. This is another Lord of the Rings card. <laughs> Three and a green enchantment. You can look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast creature spells from the top of your library, and creatures you control have tap add one mana of any color. You know, the enchantment card type is very difficult for Rakdos to answer. This is a really good, you know, late game card advantage kind of card. Great card to cast after your hand has been ripped apart by right. discard. Your creatures have been answered by removal and going to really pull you ahead in longer games. That's what I would expect this matchup to play out uh, or how I would expect it to play out. And, you know, it's going to be an effective card in those kinds of games. Yeah. And our good friend, uh, Raf Sputin, L.A. Raf, uh, he is a Yawgmoth aficionado in the moment. He told me that he had that card in his deck when he was at the Pro Tour playing Modern. 
I was like, what does that card do? And then he told me, and I was like, oh, wow, that card is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now, looking at Mason Clark's sideboard, I see three copies of Chalice of the Void, three Engineered Explosives, three Leyline of the Void, two Blood Moon, one Shieldred the Apocalypse, one Pithing Needle, one Cast into the Fire, and one Terminate. Definitely like the Terminate as an answer to Yawgmoth. I like the Pithing Needle as a preemptive answer to both Yawgmoth and Grist. Yep. I like the Shieldred as a high-impact threat for longer games. But honestly, I, I think that's it. Uh, maybe we'll see Mason bring in Leyline of the Void. That's some, something uh, that people sometimes like in this matchup because it helps you deal with those undying creatures. Right. But I think it's a little bit low impact. We'll see if Mason agrees. All right. Well, players are drawing opening hands here. We'll see if they're going to keep or take a mulligan. If they keep, we'll be underway. If they mulligan, we'll, we'll figure out something to talk about. <laughs> Mason here. I know that he likes to aggress aggressively mulligan with this Rakdos Evoke deck, looking for the turn one double grief or turn one fury. And uh, he has a ley line in the void in his opening hand as well, so it looks like he is leaning into that. And a couple Dothy Voidwalkers in there too, but it, just a bunch of lands. This looks kind of weak. Yep. Mason does uh, disagree with me, but uh, you know, it, it definitely has a lot of impact in this matchup, dealing with the Undying Creatures. Also, good against the Agatha Soul Cauldron. Right, right. So... All right, turn zero, lay line of the void for Mason Clark, and we're underway. And then back TJ's way for his turn one. We're going to start off with Forest and Delighted Halfling. It's a much better start for TJ here than Ignoble Hierarch. You know, not going to be vulnerable to Orcish Bowmasters in this game. All right, Mason down to 19. TJ still at a healthy 20, starting off with that Forest. I'm going to go back Mason's way and see if he has something to play here. There's a Fury. No red card, but we do have Dothy Voidwalker. Now, why don't you give us a little insight? How does Dothy Voidwalker work with Leyline of the Void? They're both exiling something with a replacement effect, right? Uh, they are both replacement effects, and it is typically the uh, owner of the card that chooses which one gets used. So I don't. I think this works poorly for I us. I also so. think this works poorly, so I'm glad we're on the same page. So Dothy Voidwalker, uh, you know, I think the opponent does get to choose which one it gets exiled to. I think that's what they're actually confirming right now. And yes. TJ's like, actually, I'd rather it be exiled with Leyline of the Void <laughs> instead of Dothy Voidwalker. Yeah, that's a that's definitely a strike against Leyline of the Void, sort of turning off Do the ability of Dothy Voidwalker to cast a GC spell of your opponents. Well, it's a three two shadow, so it's gonna get some beatdowns on. Yeah. Yeah, and we saw in game one, you know, Mason was ahead on the battlefield but couldn't get through all those chump blockers, and then the blood artist bled him dry. Dothy Voidwalker gets through those chump blockers very easily. All right, here is a pair of wall roots and a young wolf. This is an explosive turn number two for TJ Radizak. Four creatures on the battlefield. Back Mason's way. We're going to jam for three, play another Dothy Voidwalker, and a tapped Blood Crypt. And now we are in a racing scenario. Can TJ find a way to win the game through these exile effects? Looks like he has a Grist and a Fatal Push. Okay, Grist and Fatal Push with a... Uh, yeah, doesn't even need a land. There's plenty of mana here because of those wall of roots at the bottom of the screen, so... Uh, should be able to clear up these Dothies pretty easily and start, you know, pulling ahead in this game unless Mason has a powerful follow-up. All right. One Fatal Push takes down a Dothy Voidwalker, and we're going to use three mana to play a Grist. This Planeswalker, very powerful. When it's not on the battlefield, anywhere else, it's a 1-1 one -one insect creature in addition to its other types. That means you can find it off Court of Calling, Collected Company, all sorts of tutor effects. Uh, it's just a really sweet card. Yeah, definitely one of my favorite cards uh, in recent printing just because of the cool interactions that you get to do. It's one of my favorite Modern Horizons cards for sure. Yeah. And All right. Here comes uh, Sacrifice of the Walrus to take down the other Dothy Voidwalker. And now Mason's aggression is stifled. Let's see if he can cobble together some more pressure. Just land number four and passing back. TJ going to go ahead and fetch. Finding a tapped land more than likely. And now if you're Mason, you have to be thinking, how do I come back? Even Fury here might not be enough. Yeah, Fury, I mean, yeah, Fury would get you most of the way there. So that, Especially if he has a fifth land, which if Mason didn't cast anything that turn, it's likely he has another land in hand. So the Fury on the battlefield would be quite nice as well. Uh, and TJ doesn't have a ton of pressure here. You know, the wall doesn't attack at all. The Gris is going to make some 1-1s. He's got two other one-power creatures. So Mason has a little bit of time here, but 
you really can't let this Golgari Yawgmoth deck get a huge amount of resources, right. especially creatures on the battlefield, because it makes their top deck so powerful. Like, at this point, if if TJ finds a Court of Calling or a Yawgmoth, the game probably just ends on the spot. Yeah, and even though the Ley Line of the Void stops a lot of the infinite combos, it doesn't really stop the chain of card draw and the interaction that Yawgmoth can shrink and kill your opponent's creatures. And so you're really seeing why Ley Line of the Void is maybe not an ideal sideboard card. Not only does it turn off your Dothy Voidwalkers, but it also just doesn't stop the deck. Yeah, because it's really the card advantage that matters most. Boom, here comes Fury. We're going to take down some creatures, and we're going to kill the Grist. And now Mason is back in the driver's seat. We'll see if TJ can cobble together something here to fight back. Well, he's got another Grist as his last card in hand, so he can take down the Fury. But once again, he just won't have any pressure on Mason. So Mason will have some time to... You know, find more action. Wow, no pressure. You see Delighted Halfling in play with one power sitting there, and you say, no pressure? <laughs> TJ says, I don't even want it. Yeah, he's going to throw that away. Doesn't care about the mana, or doesn't care about attacking. Wants bigger bodies that can maybe dodge some fury and some other removal effects. Mason yeah, going to pass it back. Definitely insulating himself against a future fury from Mason. That's the re motivation for TJ to sacrifice the 1-2 over the more... Uh, well, let's say toughness endowed, Wall of Roots. <laughs> All right, uh, here's an insect token. Pendlehaven actually going to make it do some extra damage here, which is sweet. Yeah, I love me a Pendlehaven. Mason just passes back again. Oh, that's the, the the Elvish card you were talking about, El right? Elven Chorus, yeah, Elven it gets milled. I'm sure TJ would have liked to draw that one. That yeah, would be no excellent right Let's here. get that one on the screen, because that one's sweet. No, no Pendlehaven pump. So once again, I think trying... Uh, electing to insulate himself more from a Fury than push damage. Mason with another brick of a draw, it seems like. And here, we're going to go back TJ's okay. way. Here's uh, Endurance. It's going to exile the graveyard for Mason, put it on the bottom of the deck. Now we have some real pressure. This is five coming through this turn, and you're adding one power from the Grist making a token each turn. This is, uh, this is a three-turn clock. All right, we're going to jam in for five, maybe six if we go for Pendlehaven. Here comes the Bowmaster. We're going to try to shoot something down, maybe block something. And TJ at the ready with the Pendlehaven, going to protect. And now Mason likely going to block in some capacity. Might chump block, might trade for the other insect. Yep. TJ getting paid off for being patient with his Pendlehaven there. Double blocking the two, three insects. Don't, I think? I'm not 100% on that. Ah, okay. So <laughs> we're going to order blockers. TJ goes 1-2. Uh, you know, this is maybe a misstep. If if TJ had ordered blockers a different way, if he orders blockers with Orc Army first, if Mason goes for the Feign Death, he can choose to deal all two damage from the Insect to just the Army token. So maybe a, maybe a little bit of a mistake there for TJ, but we'll see if... He can still churn through. Not really that big of a deal. He's still got a healthy board position. Yep. Those are the intricacies of combat. But the Endurance is really the dominant creature on the battlefield, as well as the Grist, really, even though that is no longer a creature. Now you're seeing this Leyla in the Void hasn't really been too hurtful. And uh, TJ is still just kind of churning in. Grist showing what it can do in the face of these hate cards out of the cyborg. And trying to get a peek at what Mason has back in his hand. He's had a, several cards in hand for a while. Maybe another one of those, you know, recursive effects. He's got a fatal push, it looks like, at the top of his hand there. So uh, just nothing, no real heavy hitters. I would have loved to have, like, a Fable, the Mirror Breaker, in this game. That would have been excellent. You know, draw that Shield Rid. Uh, but instead, it just kind of left to try to uh, answer the Grist with a lot of one-for-ones and, and sort of mediocre creatures. Yeah, Gris kind of farms one-for-one one trades. All right, Orc Army going to chump block Endurance. Uh, TJ going to say that's fine. One damage coming across. Thinking about Pendlehavening. Chooses not to. And now we can tick up the Grist. I think we have another Wall Roots in hand we can deploy. It's always fun when Gris rolls over another Grist, right? Because you get the extra token. Not a whole lot of insects in these decks, but Grist itself is, which is cool. Back okay. Mason's way. And, yeah, there's... Just kind of checking out the... Still trying to check out Mason's hand here. I think it's just, just more bricks and, you know, you you might not be dead or whatever it's called. Not dead after all. Not dead after all. Just a bunch of those types of effects, it seems like. 
and a fatal push that he chose not to use last turn with the fetch land on the endurance. I imagine we'll see that get used this turn because you know life total getting kind of low there at eight. Or maybe not. I think he's just checking if he knows the hand at all or making sure he knows life totals. Yeah, you know, once that Fury died from Mason, he really just didn't have any more oomph to, to sort of take over this battlefield, start turning the corner, and become the aggressor. Yeah, you know, the, the the Fury that eventually lived in game one gave him the advantage, but wasn't quite able to close fast enough. Here, didn't even get to that point of the game, and probably would have been able to take over the game if the Fury had lived. All right, well, before damage, we're going to fetch, and then we are going to play Fatal Push with Revolt. And that is going to target the Endurance. You need to make sure Mason actually pays mana for this, or we need to know if he's shocking for the Blood Crypt. My guess is, I mean, this is on TJ's turn. It's not that big of a deal, but... All right, we're going to pump the Insect that the Bowmaster is blocking. It's going to be a 2-3 against the 2-2. And now Mason can play one of the Feign Death type cards, and that is going to bring the Bowmaster back. And the, the one damage on top of it should be able to clear it. Or at least clear one of the other tokens. Yeah, so it'll come back tapped. Because that was a literal... Or no. Okay, so that was uh, not dead after all. So we'll get the wicked roll. Okay. Mason down okay. to four after all things said and done, it seems like. Down to four, but if you can find an answer to this grist, he's pretty stable. I don't know what that answer would be. <laughs> yeah, maybe Pitch Fury plus another, you know, Undying Effect. Another land. Not going to do it. Bowmaster and a token facing off against TJ Swarm of 1-1s. One yeah, and you can say Mason's flooding this game. He is a little bit, but TJ also has plenty of lands on the battlefield, a couple of Wall of Roots as well, so... Both players drawing plenty of mana. It's really this unanswered grist that is taking over the game for TJ. Mason didn't have any of his, you know, uh, card advantage generating threats outside of that one Fury. All right, so the exact same thing that happened last turn outside of the Endurance getting Fatal Push is happening again. So we're blocking one on each token. Uh, the 2-2 two -two dies, comes back, and deals one. So two tokens are going to die. We're going to come back with the Orc Army as a 1-1. One -one. And TJ going to keep making insects and using Pendlehaven for as long as Mason wants him to. Now, this Pendlehaven has done a lot of work. You know, Without it, a single one of those undying effects creating a 2-2 against a battlefield of 1-1s would have likely forced TJ to start trying to minus 2 the Grist to clear it away. He might have been able to, you know, might have got tempoed out by uh, more copies of the undying effects. Instead, able to just you know, attack right through with the Pendlehaven and force Mason to use those un extra undying effects more defensively and keep his Gris loyalty high. All right, going back Mason's way. Can we find something? It looks like a thought he's drawn. Not the best draw here for Mason. Got life tolls updated. It looks like it's 14-6. So not life being gained, but just a miscommunication earlier. Some heaters in hand for TJ here. I saw a quarter calling and a Yawgmoth. So Ooh. this game could be ending relatively soon. All right. Well, if we quarter calling. So Blood Artist uh, requires the things to go to the graveyard, right? Yeah. So Leyline of the Void does shut that down. But just being able to, you know, draw some cards, deal with those, those creatures... Should be good enough. The 2 2 Bowmaster is a little awkward because you, you have to use two Yogmoth activations to deal with it. That's going to be two triggers for Mason. That'll grow the army, which means you need to throw more creatures at that to answer it. So, yeah, TJ going to take some time here to try to figure out what he wants to do with this Yogmoth. If only Proliferate could go down instead of always up. All right, we're going to attack with one insect. We're going to pump it. Orc army down. See if Mason has anything else. Land for TJ. Looks like a peat land, so it can uh, cycle a, that. Oh, it's a Twilight Mire. Yeah. Excuse me. All right, and a Fatal Push for Mason. That's going to take care of this Yawgmoth. Now, here's an interesting spot. So TJ can sack a couple things to kill the Bowmaster, but that's going to give Mason two triggers from the Bowmaster to make a 2-2 two -two and, er, and deal two damage. And uh, we're going to see if... Uh, TJ wants to go ahead and sack some wall roots too to draw some more cards, or, or how he wants to do this. Yeah, so sack one of the insect tokens. 
Now we got Mason deciding what he wants to target with the Bowmaster trigger. It does target the other insects. TJ can sack this in response to the Yawgmoth. Yep. And now we're going to get the Orc army up to two, and we're going to deal one damage to either Grist or Face. And then finally, the Orc army's down, and now we'll see if TJ wants to throw two Wall of Roots maybe at the Orc army before the Yawgmoth dies. He has a ton of mana already and might just want some fresh cards to look for kills or just more pressure. Life total is getting low for both players. I think TJ thinking about responding to this trigger, then he'll only have to throw one creature at the Orc army with the Yawgmoth. There's also that cord in hand for TJ, so he could elect to use these walls to power that up and cord for another threat. Looks like that's what we're going for. Here it is. This looks like a cord for three. Okay. Mason. Oh no, cord for four. He's made seven mana. All right, so we can just go get another Yawgmoth and replace the one that's in play. We're going to go get a Shield Dread, the Apocalypse. Four, five, Death Touch. And you know what? We're going to sack some things, draw some cards, and gain some life. Is yeah. that good? That'll do it. It'll also continue to pressure Mason's life total. Mason at six. <laughs> he's going to go to four on his draw step if he doesn't have another removal spell, which I do not think he does. Yeah. All right. We're going to sack that. Drain, or we're going to gain two life, kill your orc. Draw a card, Yawgmoth and Shouldred, a match made in heaven. Yeah. Or hell, I guess, honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're both kind of creepy. <laughs> oh, wow. Found Ooh. the Seiju. Oh, no. Now, Graveyard Unlocked for TJ. This is all just during TJ's turn. And so Mason will get another draw step to see... Uh, if he can find something here to, to really solve the issue. But I, I don't think that the Rakdos of Vogue deck really plays something that can handle all of this. Okay. Right. So now with Mason's Battlefield clear, it's just a question of whether TJ wants to turn these walls into cards. And he does want to do it for at least one of them. With it, so many lands, I man, oh, doesn't want to do it with the last one. All right. Each of those sacrifices costs a life, but gains two. So TJ actually drawing or drawing some cards and gaining life. Yeah. And Mason gonna take two from the shield red, and this is the squeeze. No play for Mason. Has to have Bowmaster or some other thing here to kill the shield red, or else he is gonna get beat in the first round. TJ's hand looks like Soul Cauldron, maybe a fatal push and some lands over there. Soul Cauldron can turn something into a Yawgmoth. All right. Maybe turn Shelly into a Yawgmoth. Maybe turn Walvards into a Yawgmoth. Here's Agatha Soul Cauldron. We're going to attack for four. It is another Bowmasters. Okay. We're going to deal damage to something. We're going to jump block. TJ has two removal spells. This could clear the way. He doesn't. Mason's going to jump. I think TJ has the one fatal push. He could have, uh, I guess if he had made a creature first, he could have turned one creature into a Yawgmoth, sacked the other one, the non-shielded, to deal with one of Mason's threats oh, and fatal push Miss the Lethal. other. Oh, But that requires you to, to overextend everything. I think TJ's so far ahead that he's fine to just play this slow. Yeah, squeeze the outs. Yeah. All right, here's Fable of the Mirror Breaker. We're going to get a 2-2 Goblin. Normally, this is one of the better cards that the Rakdos Evoke deck plays. And here's Fatal Push. On the Orcish Bowmasters. Agatha Soul Cauldron going to get active. Yawgmoth going to go under the Cauldron. And now this insect has all activated abilities of Yawgmoth. It's baby Yawgmoth. Gross Yawgmoth. Yeah, we, we can proliferate. <laughs> has science gone too far, Ross? Yawgmoth's experiments are out of control. I think it's gone just far enough. I love creature combo decks. <laughs> All right, and Mason packs it in. TJ Radizak with that Golgari Yogmoth on the back of a wonderful finish last weekend at SEG Columbus is 1-0 here against our, well, kind of current reigning champion. Mason won our last big event here in the Pioneer uh, 2K that we did last time. Yeah, he won the Pioneer event, also top eight of the modern event, so had a great run last month here in Caldwell, Ohio. Not starting out so well today, <laughs> running into one of the, you know, Brick stalwarts yeah. of uh, the Apex series and TJ Radizak. Mason that takes a round one loss. He'll have to rally, probably rally off six straight wins to make our, or five straight wins to make our top eight. 